I'm David Guzik, and I'm glad that you're watching this video series, Preaching Through the Gospel of John. Now, it was a long series, and there were a few weeks when I had some good friends teach for me. So the following sermon is by my friend, Pastor Keith Fortenberry, teaching this section of the Gospel of John. Enjoy. Let's open in our Bibles this morning to John chapter 21. And I'd encourage you to open your Bible and to keep it open as we will have uh, several other passages that we will look at as we do as Pastor Dave, who sends his greetings, has asked me to do and to continue on in our study through the Gospel of John. And so this morning we will consider together the first 14 verses. And what I'd like to do is read all of the verses in their entirety and then we will continue. So we begin in verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is God's word. Well, certainly one of the most popular sayings in American Christianity is represented by the four letters WWJD. I'm sure some of you have purchased the bracelets, perhaps at a bazaar or something like that in the past, and some of you may even be wearing one today. And the letters stand for, what would Jesus do? And the idea is that in any given circumstance you may find yourself, all you need to do is just look down at the little wristband and you could say, how would Jesus conduct himself in this circumstance and then seek to emulate that? Now, I think that that's a good motto. Yet I have to confess, in matters of breakfast, I don't think it's one that I desire to apply. And I say that because they're eating fish and bread. I have been with people who have eaten fish for breakfast, and they seem to enjoy it. But frankly, I, I remain uninterested in such things. <laughs> well, that's what they're doing. They're eating breakfast. And it is a breakfast that is full of significance. As the disciples, having been through the roller coaster week they were just on, are once again united with Jesus Christ. And they're there on the familiar shores of Galilee and enjoying his company, and they have just encountered him in a very powerful and purposeful way. And for one disciple in particular, 
it will be very significant for he will receive a word of restoration and reinstallment. Secondly, it is full of significance for you and I today as it reveals and it is full of insight and implication concerning our relationship with Jesus Christ as well. Now, whenever we study a passage of the Bible, there are always a certain set of questions that we need to approach the text with. And perhaps the most important question is this, what's the big picture? In other words, what is the main point that the author is seeking to communicate? And if we ask that question, we can observe that John gives it to us. You can notice in verse 14 that John says, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. The third time that Jesus showed himself. Now, John isn't interested, obviously, in calculating all the appearances. It's been counted 11 appearances in all. But the key phrase there is to his disciples. So he's not thinking about what happened with Mary. And he's only thinking about Jesus' manifestation, if we translate it correctly, I believe, to the disciples, to the apostolic band, to those that would be key in the bringing of the church and the building of the church and of the kingdom. And actually, if you look back at verse 1, you see it there. He says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again. And then in verse 1, and in this way he showed himself. Therefore, verse 1 and 14 serve as a framework for us to understand this passage. And the point is evident and it is clear that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he has demonstrably proven this and he has appeared to the disciples on numerous occasions. Therefore, the fitting thing for us to do is to believe. Okay? So that's the main point. Now, what about chapter 21? Why do we have chapter 21? Because there are certain scholars that are baffled by its presence. And the reason is if you were to look at verse 31 or of chapter 20, John says concerning this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life. Now, that looks like a good way to end a book, doesn't it? That looks like a fitting summary statement and conclusion. And so, of course, various suggestions and um, scenarios have been offered. But bypassing all the other ones, let me just point out several things for your consideration. And in the first place, if you're familiar with the writings of John, you know that this is not uncharacteristic of John. If you go to John... 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, you may recall that he says here, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Looks like a good ending, doesn't it? Not for John. Verse 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him. And then he goes on to describe this confidence. And so it is not uncharacteristic of John to look like he's finished and then to keep going. Now, John is a preacher in the truest sense of the word, isn't he? Never finishes when he says he's going to finish. <laughs> Another reason that John uh, has written this, though, is that if he were to finish the book right there, there are certain questions that would have been lingering in people's minds that needed to be addressed. And John is addressing these questions. And forefront to our mind is the lingering question about Peter. That is, what are we to make of Peter? Is Peter ever going to come back into a place of leadership and usefulness in the service of Christ? Well, John 21, and we'll have occasion, God willing, next week to see that John answers that in the restoration of Peter. But if you look at chapter 20 and verse 31, you'll notice that John says his whole point is that people would believe. And therefore, 
the manifestation of Jesus in John 21 is in order to reinforce and to encourage such belief in the resurrected Lord. And if you look at chapter 20 and verse 30, he says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. And it very well could be that he was thinking about all these things that he didn't have time to include, and he might have thought, this is a key piece of information, and it's just too good of a story for me to leave out. Perhaps that is why he has given us chapter 21. Ultimately, we know God wanted it there. He wrote it, and we've got it, and that's what it is. Now, all that by way of introduction. Now, as we look at the passage this morning, we will operate under three divisions, and I'll give them to you now. First of all, we will note the setting that is set. The setting that is set. And then we will consider in the boat, and then lastly, on the shore, spending the majority of our time on the second. The setting that is set in the boat and on the shore. Okay, so here we go, the setting that is set. The setting is provided for us in the opening verses of this chapter in verse 1 and 2. We are told in the first place when it happens, after these things. After what things? The things in chapter 20, the resurrection of Jesus and the subsequent appearances of Jesus to Mary, to the disciples, the whole drama with Thomas, After all of these things, this is when this happens. Pretty clear, isn't it? And then we're told who's involved. Verse 2, we're given a list of five or a number of disciples, seven altogether, and two of them remain unnamed. Okay, so that's when it was. That's who's involved. And then we get to what they will be doing. They go fishing. And then we're told where they are. They're in Galilee. They're at the Sea of Tiberias. So the scene has shifted from the mountains of Jerusalem to the shores of Galilee. All right? Straightforward, isn't it? There we have it. Where are they? When are they there? What are they doing? But the real question isn't, why are they there? After all, isn't that the question that you want to know? What in the world are they doing in Galilee? Why have they gone back to Galilee from Jerusalem? Now listen, before we begin to accuse them of apostasy and of abandoning their call before the Lord, we do well to remember that the reason that they're in Galilee is because Jesus had told them to. Maybe you remember in John, or excuse me, Mark chapter 14 and verse 28, having predicted the Peter of denial, or the denial of Peter and the scattering of the sheep, he says in verse 28, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And then after he's risen from the dead and the women are at the tomb and there is a man there and he speaks to them, he says in Mark 16 and verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So why are they in Galilee? Because Jesus said. So instead of us in our initial reaction to say, oh, they must be abandoning the Lord, they must be apostatizing, rather we find them in Galilee in an act of obedience. He's going to go to Galilee. He's going to meet you there. And so they go. Now, were they perfect? No. Did they have it all figured out at this point? No. Were they certain and sure of how things were going to unfold? No, not at all. But they did act in obedience. And so they go to Galilee. And so there we see them in Galilee as the Lord had said. Now, I want you to notice with me at the end of verse 2. Though we're told here that the disciples were together. They were together. And I think that that is worth pointing out. And I'm thankful to Alexander McLaren who helped me see this clearly this week. And the reason that this is worth pointing out 
is because the natural thing to do at this point would be for the disciples to give up and to cash it in and to scatter. Well, boys, it's been a good three years, hasn't it? We've seen a lot. We've done a lot. Peter, you did a lot, didn't you? You walked on water. You sank. And let's not all forget about what you did just the other week. You denied the Lord. Do you remember that? We've had ups and we've had downs, haven't we? Well, it's been good. But I guess it's over. We've gotten as deep as we're going to get into the playoffs. It's just time to disband and put this thing to rest once and for all. Yet nevertheless, there they are. And they are together. But if you think about it, this really shouldn't surprise us, should it? After all, we're told in John 17 that Jesus prayed for them. And I think it's helpful for us to hear the verse. And so I'll read it. Jesus in his prayer says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Okay? You got that? They were given to Jesus by the Father. He prays that he would keep them. And he prays that they would be one. And that is precisely what we see. They belong to Jesus. They are kept. And they are in unison. Even in their most confusing and discouraging moments, they are partaking of the benefits of Christ's prayer. And the marvelous thing about this is they had no idea. But yet it was the power of Christ's prayer that was holding them. I do think that an immediate and relevant point of application is readily apparent, is it not? For is that not the same for you and I today? Oh, it doesn't matter how we feel, how hopeless the situation might be, how confusing the circumstances are, how uncertain the prospects that await us in the future might be. None of that matters. Christ has prayed for us. And the matter of the fact is, no matter what you think or what you're feeling, the ultimate reality about your life is that you belong to Jesus, gifted by the Father. And he has prayed for you. And he will keep you. And he's going to be sure that you get from point A all the way to point Z. I don't really think that the Father's going to say, Jesus, good prayer, but I'm not going to answer it. No. And if you take time to think about the course of your life and to think about your past and to think about your journey and to think about the fact that here you are on this Lord's day worshiping the Lord. Why? Because we all know what we've done. We all know the good, the bad, the sin, the stumbling, the failures, and the discouragements. And yet here we are. A testimony to the keeping power of God. The fact that he prays for us. Father, keep them. Guess what? He does. Now I can almost guarantee you that the disciples at this point weren't having a deep conversation about the Lord's prayer. He said he'd keep us. Isn't it fascinating that he said he'd keep us? Yes, it is, because here we are, and your friends are my friends, and my friends are your friends, and we're all kept by the power of Jesus' prayer. No, not at all. These guys are confused. These guys are scared. Yet we see the reality of Christ's prayer holding them. And if you think about it, what is it that has held the church together in her entire existence? Oh, it's certainly not how clever we are, is it? It's not our abilities, and it's not our efforts. You just pause to think about your life. What is it? It's not, nothing else can explain it other than the fact that you belong to Jesus. And the Father hears his prayers. Well, that's the setting that is set. Now we notice the next scene in the boat. We're told in verse 3 that they decide to go on an expedition. And the expedition is, surprise, surprise, to go fishing. 
Now we could ask ourselves, why is it that they have chosen to go fishing? And that's a reasonable question, isn't it? Maybe they've decided to go back to the old profession. As a matter of fact, it says here they get into the boat, and some say that that means they got into the very same boat that they left three years ago upon receiving the call to follow Jesus. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe they said, all right, nothing else works. Ministry's a sham. Christ, he was here. He was killed. He rose. He was here. He's not here. Now he's gone again. He said he'd be here. I'm just not sure what to think. Tell you what I'll do. I know how to fish. That's what I'm good at. That's what I'll go do. Were they going back to the old job? Maybe. Or maybe it was purely economic. Hey, we got to make money. Or maybe they were hungry. After all, what's wrong with fishing for food? Or maybe they were doing it just to kill time. After all, man, be honest, that's all you're doing when you're fishing, isn't it? <laughs> right? You're like that country song. She told, choose me, you're fishing. I sure love her, but I love to fish. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. The fact of the matter is, I wrote down three little letters in my notes. They're very helpful, and I'm going to give them to you. You kids will get this. I D K. I don't know. Why don't I know? John didn't tell me. Therefore, I don't know. And I'm completely content with it. Now, we do entertain the idea. Are, are they getting ready to turn their back on the Lord? Maybe. But again, I don't know. But what we do know from the passage is clear. All of this was at the initiation of Peter. It was Peter's idea. I'm going fishing. We're going to go with you. Notice with me for a moment the leadership of Peter. Here's Peter, flawed as he is. We could all agree on that. A failure, a big failure in many ways as he is. We could all agree on that. And yet here he still functions as a leader among the disciples. I'm going fishing. We're going to. If you're a leader... People will follow you, won't they? That's just what a leader is, leading other people. And it's a great privilege to be a leader in God's church. But it also comes with the haunting reality that people will follow you. And if you're a leader, you better know who's leading you. Somebody once said, what's the best mark of a leader? Various suggestions were offered. The best I heard was, they need to be led. Who's leading the leaders? You better know who's leading you. You better know where you're going. And it better be the right place. Because behind you are a number of souls, precious and purchased by the blood of Jesus. Now, the whole adventure proves to be fruitless and futile. We're not really told in great detail about much, but we're told that they caught nothing. Now think about it. These skilled men, it wasn't like these guys didn't know what they were doing. They weren't um, um, Opie Griffith, you know, walking down to the fishing hole. Pa, I'm going fishing even though I don't know what I'm doing. These guys knew what they were doing. They would have hit all the good spots, all the secret spots. All the tricks of the trade that they had accumulated in their entire craft, and they caught nothing. If this isn't discouraging enough when you're reading, think about for them, the one thing that they're supposed to be good at. I mean, if there's anything that they could do, you would think that they know how to fish. Yeah, it's been three years, but come on. Yet, the very thing that you would think that they'd be successful at, they can't even do with any kind of modicum of success at all. Absolutely futile. Absolutely fruitless. Well, John's painting a picture, isn't he? Here's a picture of a group of guys, obedient. But the picture that is painted is of men who are confused tired, they're weary, they're frustrated, they're exhausted, 
They're discouraged. Net after net after net, empty. And the picture is painted, isn't it? Absolutely fruitless. And now the morning comes. Just picture for a moment the soft water hitting the hole of the boat. The sun starts to rise over the Syrian sky. Black gives way to orange, orange to purple, purple to blue. A morning mist starts to cover the sea. Wet ropes, calloused hands, and empty nets. And you have to wonder, are the empty nets a fitting illustration of their empty hearts? Absolutely fruitless. And what they didn't know is that Jesus was only about 100 yards away. Jesus is on the shore. And it appears that they might have been able to see him because it says he was there, and they didn't know that it was him. Why didn't they know it was him? I don't know. Maybe that the fog of the morning uh, sea layer was there. Maybe they couldn't see 100 yards away. Whatever it was, they didn't know that it was him. And Jesus is there on the shore, and he calls out to them. And notice how he addresses them. Children, have you any food? Now, the word children is an endearing term, and some suggest that we should understand it uh, as a very friendly call. So it could have been uh, like lads, or if you're from where I'm from, it would have been something like, um, hey, homie, or hey, fool. Right? Aaron Austin was talking about white people trying to think they're Mexican. I go, wow, that was my childhood growing up in the valley. <laughs> Whatever it was, hey, fellas, caught anything? Now the disciples are sitting in the boat, and they, they don't even ask, what do you want, old timer? No. They just have a very simple response. No. Thanks for asking. That's quite embarrassing. So the man on the shore continues and he says, why don't you cast your net on the right side? And he doesn't say, cast it on the right side, maybe there's something there. No, notice the certainty in his voice. He says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And the marvelous thing is, these professional fishermen take the advice of the stranger. And they do exactly as he says. And we're told that having cast the net on the right side of the boat, that the catch is so big that they're unable to bring it in. I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but I would like you to consider when it was that he had called out to them. It wasn't in a moment of great success, was it? It wasn't in a moment of great encouragement. But it was in the moment when they were tired and weary and frustrated and at the end of themselves. And it is at that moment that the Lord calls to them. And he provides a catch, a huge catch. John tells us, doesn't he? 153 Large fish, not a bunch of perch, big fish, real big fish, 153 of them. Now, what's interesting is that in your studies, if you ever study a passage like this, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between what is intended to be commentary and what is intended to be comedy. And I say that because... You should see the sorts of scenarios that are offered for the number 153. Ooh, 153 fish. You know what that means, don't you? Yeah, 153 fish. No, it means something else. What do you mean it means something else? 
don't you see what Jesus is really doing with the 153 fish? No, I don't. John says 153. I thought 153 means 153. And then it's like that little song, said the shepherd boy to the little lamb. Do you see what I see? No, I don't see what you see. Why can't 153 just mean 153? Listen, don't go looking for all sorts of garbage in the Bible. It's just embarrassing. <laughs> well, why, why, then why does John count it? Again, this is your phrase for today, isn't it? I don't know. But he did. He gives the details. And he's an eyewitness. Now think about it. Fishermen count their fish, right? Oh, I caught 10 ling cod. I got five rock cod. Caught five salmon, right? Very proud of it. And the astonishingly large size of the fish and of the catch would have given them reason to say, well, let's just see how many of these buggers are in here. And so they count them. Now notice with me the complementary dispositions of John and Peter. On the one hand, you see the inside of John. And on the other hand, you see the action of Peter. Now, notice the inside of John. John observes what is going on, and he begins to connect the dots. I remember something like this. Three years ago, in this boat, in this lake, an empty net after a long night. And then a guy showed up. And he said to do this, and we did it, and we caught fish. And that guy turned out to be the Messiah. See, John's the, the brains here. And John's starting to figure it out. Now, the similarities between what did we read here and their initial calling in Luke chapter 5 leads us to consider that in this miracle, there may be a lesson that is being offered. And the lesson would be as to what it means to serve in Christ's church. Now, I say that, and I say it very carefully and very responsibly. I've just told you 153 means 153, okay? I'm not interested in the Trinity and the law and the sevenfold spirit and all that other garbage. All of that, like Don Carson said, it's just not convincing. But the way that uh, John tells us in verse 1, that he showed himself to the disciples in this way, seems to invite us to observe some lessons. So in this catch, there are several lessons that I think are observable, and I give them to you. In the first place, they are still called to kingdom work. They are still called to kingdom work. Again, all of the similarities between their initial calling in Luke chapter 5 and the events recorded for us here may have been Jesus' way to reassure them, to say to them, the work to which I have called you, I've still called you to it. And the work of the mission and evangelism and the building of the church in all of your confusion and in all of your doubt, listen, that's still what I'm going to do with you. Now, for those of us who are in vocational ministry, if we're honest, at times we find ourselves needing such things from God, having to go back and to revisit the occasion of our calling in order to secure confidence and courage and commitment to continue on in the work. And we're often faced with the question, is what I'm doing what I should be doing? Or should I be doing something else? And that's the question that often comes on the wings of despair, depression, and discouragement. It would have been very helpful for the disciples to know, okay, he's still going to use us. Secondly, 
he may have been reinforcing what he had told them in John 15. When he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and you must abide in me, and apart from me, you can do nothing. And so this may have served to illustrate that fact very profoundly to them. Apart from me, you'll be fruitless. But in obedience to me and in abiding to me, you will be fruitful. The last observation could have been this, that Jesus is seeking to teach them that Jesus must guide and direct the endeavors of the church. Put the net over there. That's where you're going to find the fish. Jesus has to guide the activity of the church. In other words, we don't want to just do things, do we? We don't want to be a church that's just busy, doing good things, Christian things, biblical things. But rather what we need is to be directed by God. We need to be directed by him, led by him, and empowered by him. Because ultimately, he is the one with the plan. And he is the one who said he would build his church. And therefore, we have to be in the posture of dependence, seeking the sensitivity of God's guidance. Well, those are the lessons. I hope that they're helpful. Back to John's insight. Again, John is the brains of the bunch, isn't he? He's been demonstrating his knowledge of the Old Testament throughout the course of the book. He's a theologian of the highest order and ability, and he makes the connection. And he says, it's the Lord. All this is too familiar. It's all too familiar to that first day that he came and he called us. It's undeniable. This is the Lord. And the revelation of Christ at this moment lands on his heart with power and profound purpose. And he knew immediately that it was the Lord who was calling to them from the shore. It's the Lord. I ask you this morning, frankly, with sincerity and with urgency, Do you know anything about this? Do you know anything of the revelation of Christ in your heart? To know that he is calling you and to be able to say, that's him. It's the Lord. Do you know anything about that sensation at all? And I ask you, because I am persuaded that in the preaching of the Bible, God's people will hear God's voice and his sheep will hear him and they will recognize his voice and they will subsequently follow him it's the lord have you made that declaration have you heard him call you oh i wouldn't just i wouldn't doubt that right now he's speaking to many hearts right now he's calling you That's him. That's the inside of John. Moving now to the action of Peter. John turns to Peter, and it seems before he could even get the words out of his mouth, Peter's in the water, isn't he? Peter, impulsive as he is, plunges into the sea. Isn't it interesting? Peter has, he just, maybe he just doesn't like to be in boats. I don't know what it is, but it seems almost every time we find him on the lake, he's going out into the water. And Peter girds himself up in order to run to Christ without haste and without impediment. There's something marvelous about this. Immediately, no hesitation, no abandonment. Uh, One guy said he must have done like a cannonball. He goes in the water. And at this point, all that Peter wanted was to be with the Lord. That's it. That's all he wanted. He's there. That's him. You're sure? I'm going. And off Peter goes. Let me just use this as an occasion of exhortation. If you find yourself 
to have affinity with Peter, no matter how great your failure, no matter how great your fall, don't let that be an occasion of running from Jesus. Rather, let it be an occasion to run to him. At this point, Peter said, I just want Jesus. And there he goes, off in the water, the good, the bad, the ugly, the boldness, the stupidity, the bullheadedness, the apostasy, every other label you could think of, he says, I don't care. It's all going to Jesus. Swimming through the water, wading through the water until finally he arrives on the shore drenched and panting, eager to be with Jesus. Now, we, before we move to the shore, I'd like to also make an observation about the church. Because surely, surely this passage shows us that we need to appreciate the diversity of personalities within the church, don't we? On the one hand, you have the inside of John. And we need that. We need people who are able to think, to think well, to think deeply, in order to guide the doctrinal stability of the church. Now, on the other hand, we need the action of Peter, don't we? Those who say, I don't really get it all, but he said, do it, I'm going to do it. And we balance each other out. Very often, haven't you found that our tendency is to try to make everybody just like we are? I often find myself thinking, man, these people, what's wrong with them? I don't like them. I love them because I have to. <laughs> I don't like what they're doing. I like what they're doing, but I don't like how they're doing what they're doing. What, what is this all about? I want everybody to be like me. And then I have the astonishing revelation. That's a scary thought. <laughs> if everybody else was just like me, that would be the most depressed and depressing group of people you'd ever witnessed. You don't know how many times I've been told before I preach, smile. <laughs> That's our tendency. Why don't you like him? Because he's so different. And we need it. We need it. I know in this church we've probably got some Peters We've probably got some Johns, and we've probably got some Thomases too, huh? Here's the funny thing. Allow me. What what Thomas say? I'm going to go ahead and take a guess. The Lord, what? Nah. Come on, John. It makes, reminds me of the Mad Hatter, you know. Let's not be silly. Surely that's not the Lord. Oh, we need it all. We need Thomas, Peter, John. And notice that there's even those that are unnamed, and I don't want to read too much into this. But there are those that will never be in the spotlight, never known, never seem to be the most important, yet nonetheless important to God. And I know how the tendency is. Oh, he is a big personality. He's on the platform. He has more Twitter followers than the town I grew up in. He's got a book out. Surely he's important, yes. It must be that way, shouldn't it? No. It's not about being recognized. It's just about being with the others. And if I could encourage you, you might go through your whole Christian life without anybody knowing anything about you. And that's okay. Because you belong. And there is a place for you. And you belong to Christ. Well, we come now to the shore. In verse 8, they all finally arrive. And they arrive to a welcoming scene. They see that Jesus has prepared a fire and fish and bread. Interestingly enough, the last time we saw a fire of coals, it was at the scene of Peter's denial. You have to wonder if Peter's eyes were fixed on that fire. 
replaying over and over and over his failure. And what was a scene of a denial now will become a scene of restoration. And Jesus invites them. He says, come. Eat. Notice he doesn't say, listen, you idiots. When are you guys going to figure it out? I can't believe how stupid you are. What are you doing in the boat? Thomas, I'll do with you later. <laughs> but you guys, you're an embarrassment. You're a failure. As a matter of fact, I don't even know what I'm doing with you. No. He's never like that. He says, come. Come spend time with me. And to eat is a symbol of fellowship. It might not be to us. To us, eating is drive through burger, finish it before you're on the 101, isn't it? <laughs> no, not to them. It meant I like you. I want to spend time with you. That's why our very last night, in, my last night in Istanbul, after a busy two weeks of ministry, we get invited to somebody's house. We're going to go eat chick kufta. I don't like chick kufta. It doesn't matter. They want us to go. Two hours in Istanbul traffic. Get to the house. Another two hours before the food's ready. Why are we there? Because they want us there. And it's a symbol of fellowship. And the marvelous thing is that when Jesus invites us, he says, I actually want to spend time with you. I enjoy it. I wonder if you have that idea of Jesus in your mind. He doesn't just put up with you. He thoroughly enjoys your company. Now, notice that when he called to them, they were at their lowest point. And they come to see that he is prepared for them and that he is ready to serve them. And have you not noticed that at your lowest times, it seems to be when you hear his voice the clearest. And when you come, you find that he has been preparing good things. And he intends to serve you. He says, come. Come be with me. Just consider very quickly two invitations that Jesus offers. On the one hand, he says in John 7, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Is that you? Are you thirsty, spiritually dry? Come drink. Come be satisfied with his grace. He says in another place, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is that you? Tired, worn out, trying to do it on your own. He says, you come. And I will give you rest. And the marvelous thing is that the invitation stands. And on a day such as today, the invitation stands. And it is only fitting for someone in my place to let you know he invites you. Come. Don't say, oh, you don't know what I've done. Look at Peter. Don't say, but you don't know. I don't have it all figured out. I think I doubt some stuff. Look at Thomas. He says, come. You come. He says, come. Find life. Find hope. Find meaning. Find forgiveness. Find the reason that you're here in the first place. And I will welcome you. And I will serve you. And we'll fellowship together. Come. That's it. Come. What would hold you back today? Come. Come and find life. He says, come. And so I ask you, have you come? Why not today? In a moment, our prayer team will be here, and you'll have an opportunity to do that. I'll close us with prayer. The prayer team will be here. For those of us who know the Lord, what are we to do? Fellowship with him. 
very, may, very well may be that you've heard his voice and you said it's the Lord. You can come. Somebody up here will walk you through what it means to become a Christian and to understand what it means to follow Christ. Father, we thank you for your immense kindness to us. We confess we don't have it together. We're often more like the disciples in their doubting and in their failures. But yet you remain the same. Father, I pray for those that have yet to call on you as Lord. You tell us that all that the Father gives, Jesus will come. I pray they come. You said no one can come unless you draw. I pray that you draw them. And I pray for the insight of John, but also for the action of Peter to come. We thank you for praying, for paying our penalty, and continuing to serve us in all circumstances. We pray it through Christ and for his sake. Amen. Amen.